So now let's talk about issues when you choose local dimensions. We we'll talk about two issues in particular, issues related to synchronization and how much you utilize the device. So say we have a setup here, we have a global domain of 20 by 20, that is our global dimensions are 20 by 20, we've got 400 work items or 400 threads, and a work group size of 4 by 4. So for a work group size of 4 by 4, we're going to have something that's divided up like this, where each one of these are the local groups. So if you have two work items in the same group here, these ones can go ahead and synchronize. That is, this work item or thread can wait for this work item or thread to finish. And that synchronization is okay because it's in the same work group. However, if we have two arbitrary threads that are in different work groups, synchronization here is not okay because they're in different work groups. And this has some implications because there are limitations on the size of the local work group. So typically the local work groups can be about 512 threads maximum, up to 1,024, but it depends on how complicated the code you're running is. This has implications for your algorithms. So what we'll see is when you look at reduction, depending on your work group size, you can do more or less work in each step of the reduction. So let's take a look at synchronization in reduction. So here I've got some input data, just a bunch of numbers, and what I want to do in this reduction, I want to add them up in parallel. So the way to do this is we're going to add up the first two, and we're going to add up the next two, and we're going to keep going through and doing this, and add them all up in pairs. Now I've got one set of reduction. We've taken these numbers and reduced it to half as many numbers, and now we're going to go through and do the same thing in a second reduction. So we're going to add up those results, and then the third reduction, and finally the fourth reduction. So we're building this tree structure to express parallelism and going ahead and doing adding up with the numbers. Now, you should note that this is not just limited to addition. You can do all sorts of things, sums, min, max, a whole bunch of different things with reductions. Let's take a look at what the issues here are. So here's the code that we want to do, or this is the application we want to do. Let's see where our threads get assigned. So we're going to find the first thread, thread 0 over here to the first one, and thread 1 to the second one, and we're going to go through. So here we've got eight threads doing the first stage in our reduction. Now on the next stage, thread 0 is going to do the next chunk of work here. Now question, when we get here, what does thread 0 need to do before it starts on this next step? So what do we need to do before we can do this addition? Well, in this case, thread 0 needs to wait for thread 1. So thread 0 knows that it finished its own addition before that, but it doesn't know when thread 1 is done. And if it doesn't wait for thread 1 to finish, it might be adding up garbage values. So what this says is that we need to go in and we need to put in a barrier. We need the barrier in here to prevent thread 0 from continuing until thread 0 and 1 are finished. Now we're going to have to have barriers all the rights of the way through here to make sure that each of the second generation of threads here, in the second reduction step, waits for the first one to be finished. And then we'll have to have them again here for the third one, and finally here for the fourth one. So, so far this looks fine. Now let's see what happens when we bring local work groups into this. So here are the local work groups. We've got a work group size of four. So the first four threads are in one work group, and the second four threads are in the next work group. Now, is there a problem with thread one here waiting on threads two and three? Well, the answer is no, there's no problem here. Threads 1, 2, and 3 are all in the same work group. Work group size 4 means these are all in the same one here. How about when we get over here? Is there a problem with thread 2 waiting for threads 4 and 5? Well, in this case, there is a problem. So threads 4 and 5 are from the second work group, while thread 2 over here is in the first work group. Remember, the work group size is 4. So threads 0 through 3 are in one work group, and 4 through 7 are in the other one. So this is the problem that we have here with what's going on here. We can't do this synchronization in OpenCL because thread 2 is waiting for threads 4 and 5 which are in a different work group. And that means that this limits the kind of programs you can write. You couldn't write this reduction where the second bunch of threads were in a different work group than the first bunch of threads because you'd have no way to guarantee the first ones had finished. So why do we have this limited synchronization? Well basically because it scales well and that's the key thing. You only need to communicate within a work group. You don't need global communication. And this is very important because GPUs run hundreds of, work, hundreds of threads in parallel in a lot of work groups. So let's take a look at a schematic of an AMD GPU. And we see here is these are these uh, compute units. This compute unit's going to run a whole bunch of work items on it. And what you'll notice is that it's probably pretty cheap to synchronize within one of these compute units but it would be very expensive to support arbitrary synchronization anywhere on this chip. And so that's why you have this limitation. 
So what about doing a spin lock? Why not just do while lock is not set, keep doing something and wait. So this seems like a reasonable thing to do and let's take a look at where it can be a problem. So here's my GPU. Let's say it has four of these compute units on it. So four processors that are gonna run my work items. And I've got a whole bunch of work groups that are gonna go ahead and run. So I've got lots of threads here. Four of these work groups fit on the device at once and the other ones are gonna to wait to run when these ones are done. Now I wanna write my spin lock. So for my spin lock, I'm gonna have one of these work items wait on one of these work items. So pretty straightforward. Work item number three, which is in work group zero, is going to wait for work item 66 in work group four. So work item 66 is gonna set this lock value and work item three is just gonna spin waiting for it. So what happens here? So what happens if the GPU runs work groups zero and four on the same compute unit? So the same physical hardware, it's gonna swap these back and forth, but it only switches out work group zero when it's finished. So what happens to this code in this situation? Well, you're gonna get a deadlock. So work group four is never going to run because work group zero is sitting there waiting for work group four. And the problem here is that you have no guarantee of forward progress. So the scheduler decides where to put these things doesn't give you any promises that even if this one is stuck, everything else is gonna to get to run. And until you get that kind of guarantee from the scheduler, you can't really do spin locks reliably. All right, so how do you do global synchronization in OpenCL? The answer is you can only do it at the end of a kernel execution. So in that reduction example, you'd have one kernel for the first row and another kernel for the next one, and after each kernel, you'd get global synchronization. This is very expensive. It makes you have to think carefully about how you're gonna implement your algorithm. Now, this is one of the benefits of CUDA. So NVIDIA on newer hardware supports more flexible synchronization, but it supports it at a much lower performance. So if you use this synchronization too much, you end up hurting your performance a lot. Let's take a look at a slightly different issue that comes out when you choose different local device, si local workgroup sizes, and that's device utilization. So we already saw that workgroups run together on these compute units, and what we run into here is if the size of the workgroup is not matched to the size of the compute unit, that is the number of threads you can run all at once, you end up wasting parts of it. So let's take a look at an example. Say I've got a problem with a global size of 1300 by 2000, and a local size of 13 by four. So that means each work group has 13 times four or 52 threads in it. So these 52 threads are gonna to run together on one of these compute unit, one of these physical pieces of hardware. So here we got our physical piece of hardware here. Each compute unit's gonna run one work group. Now, if the hardware has 16 cores per compute unit, so it's gotta run 52 threads on 16 cores, and it's gonna time multiplex them, so it's gonna run them in groups on there, what's gonna happen? Well, we'll use 100% of them for the first three groups of 16. So the first group of 16, we'll use all of the cores, because we got 16 cores. The next group of 16, we'll use all 16 cores, and the next group of 16, we'll use all of the cores. But what happens for the last ones? So 52 doesn't divide nicely into 16. So after having run three groups of 16 here, remember our hardware has 16 cores, we've got to run 52 work items, we've got four left over. So what happens with those last four items? Well, they're gonna run on all, they're gonna run four of these on 16 cores. So we're gonna waste a lot. We're gonna take our 16 hardware cores, we're gonna run four useful threads, and then the other 12 of them are just gonna sit there idle. So by having our work group size here, not an even multiple of the physical hardware size, we have a really bad utilization. We're now wasting all of these cores when we do this part of the work. And so you have to be careful about this to make sure that your work group sizes match nicely to the hardware size. All right, so how do we choose dimensions? Well, for global dimensions, you choose something that works well for your problem. Remember we saw the example of high definition video having one, one work item per pixel or maybe audio processing having one work item for every sample. If you have too few of these, you don't get any latency hiding. So on a GPU, remember you need lots of threads in order to have work to do while you're waiting for memory. And if you're running on a CPU, you need a few threads if you have multiple threads on your CPU cores. If you have too many work items, however, you may have too much overhead. And this is particularly a problem on the CPU. So if you try to run 10,000 work items on a CPU, 
you're going to find that each one of those is doing very little work and it's not very efficient. Whereas on the GPU, there's a lot of hardware to help out with that. So in general, if you're running on a GPU, you probably want more than 2,000 work items and in nice multiples of the physical hardware size. So 16 or 32 on NVIDIA, 64 on AMD. On a CPU, you probably want about two times the number of CPU cores. Now you probably want that, but some people do clever things. So Intel does some nice stuff here where if you have too many CPU threads, they'll combine them together efficiently. So how do you choose local dimensions? Well, we saw it may be determined by the algorithm. So in the reduction example, your local dimensions are determined by the algorithm, where you need your synchronization. But in general, you want to optimize it for the best processor utilization, and this depends on the number of processor cores you have in each compute unit. So this is really a trial and error process where you just try different local dimension sizes until you get the best performance.